وطبيب نفوسنا وشفيع ذنوبنا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد صلوات الله وسلامه عليه وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين الذين أذهب الله عنهم الرجس وطهرهم تطهيرا اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي امري واحلل عقدة من لساني يفقه قولي My dear brothers and sisters assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Today inshallah and next week and the week after we will be discussing about very important subject this is the subject of tawhid what are the benefits of tawhid that will be inshallah our discussion series of discussion we want to explore this particular topic to see when we as shias we come to learn that among the five usuluddin tawhid is the first one usuluddin are five the first one is tawhid then of course we have adala and then we have nubuwa and imama and ma'ad those five principles of religion are very important for us to explore them closely and to ask ourselves what is the benefit of these usuluddin so tonight next week and the week after inshallah we will be discussing about the benefits of tawhid and these benefits are divided into two one is the spiritual benefit of tawhid and number two the physical benefit of tawhid because as as muslims we believe sincerely that whatever ibadah whatever concept which it has been made as wajib for us to follow there are two types of benefits one is spiritual and another one is physical spiritual aspect of tawhid we are going to see today if it were not for us to follow tawhid we would be astray and many difficulties will will follow us so when we see the mother of ahlul bayt is saying that there are five concepts five principles which are known as usuluddin and the first one is tawhid then it means there is something very important there and unfortunately on the other side if you ask me why did we decide to take this particular topic as a point of our discussion it's because we see these days in our communities unfortunately the concept of tawhid is slipping a little bit slowly from some people why because there is a thin line between tawhid and shirk and that thin line it's easy for one to jump from shirk to tawhid and from tawhid to shirk so because of this it's very important we need to evaluate this particular subject time and again it is not sufficient for us to say well when we were young especially we as adults when we were young we went to madrasa we went to sunday school saturday school evening quranic madrasa we learned about tawhid it's enough no 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 it's not we need to recheck ourselves again and again and again and especially when we remember the hadith from the holy prophet muhammad sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam allah muhammad wa muhammad that any one of us when we are in that state of sakratil maut when we are about to die when we are about to be made to depart from this world shaitan comes closer to us doing was was making us busy to forget about tawhid and that's why we have two as followers of ahlul bayt we have two types of talqin what is talqin talqin are those words which we say when we bury someone after the burial there are sentences paragraphs we say as declaration of shahada to the person who is buried that is what we are used to see but there is another talqin when someone is in sakratil maut 
laqinuhu shahada the holy prophet says repeat the wordings of shahada to this particular individual why because there shaitan is busy wants to take him away from whatever we have built or we have been building in terms of faith to demolish that in order for us to be mushrikeen or to be mulhidin people who don't follow any religion ethics so for this reason the discussion about tawhid is very important to remind ourselves and that's why if you take the book for example mafatihul jinan you may see there there is dua which is known as dua ul adila among the duas which we don't recite frequently dua al adila this al adila is the dua which reminds us to say the wordings when we are in sakratil maut why because it reminds you that allah is one the holy prophet is rasulullah then aimma alayhi wasalam you mention each one of them until the 12th and you remind this particular individual by reciting that so that he can die or up, uh, on the principles of tawhid so tawhid is very important for us to explore it again and again and unfortunately again we live it within the society where we see that there are groups of people sometimes even we don't know where are they coming from busy within our communities and they come they will be busy during the special occasions of wilada and wafat and they will do things which are against the mother of ahlul bayt and unfortunately sometimes we don't have any power to stop them and they will be busy i'm sure you have come across people who call themselves shia of imam ali and they smoke weed yeah instead of going for salah they will go to smoke weed and not only that they will introduce many many other things within the mother of ahlul bayt which are bid'ah innovations we don't say things and they will come because they are growing bigger in number they will dominate our centers sometimes and they will introduce innovations and shirk until when we cannot be able to differentiate what is tawhid and what is shirk at that moment our youngsters young people who do not have proper basics of our madhab then they will try to follow them and go astray so this subject is very important that's why we said we need to discuss about these things and some other times as well one of the issues may come to us is the issue of why you she as you do tawassul because tawassul according to other people is shirk what is tawassul when you say ya wajihan inda allah ishfa alana inda allah o rasulullah o amirul mu'minin o zahra o aba abdullah o aba muhammad al hasan and so on and so forth people may come to us and say if you have allah why do you go through these people these individuals why don't you say ya allah so they confuse us for this reason we need to be aware of the benefits of tawhid and that's why today we want to discuss about this particular subject so that's that's why we need at least three weeks i know some many many other fine scholars when they discuss about this particular subject they go many weeks in this discussing about tawhid because there are many aspects so let us see the first thing when we discuss about tawhid is the word in arabic if you can go back a bit the word in arabic is tawhid the way we see there ta waw ha ya and dal tawhid as tawhid in arabic word comes from wa ha da wa ha and dal <coughs> wa ha da it means one the concept of one and allah is known as allahul wahid he is the only one and this al wahid when we say al wahid and ahad it means that we purify him from many things which are known as shirk so that's the word in english we find tawhid the way we write there there or it can be written as t a u h e e d o h i d tawhid 
But the most important thing is the word in Arabic. So, what do we want to achieve here? Our aims and objectives are some of the aims and objectives. Number one, to understand the meaning of Tawheed. We may know the word Tawheed, but do we understand the meaning of it? So that's our aim. We want to discuss about that. And number two, to know Allah well. Yes, we may speak, we may pronounce Allah, but we need to know Him well through Tawheed or through discussion about Tawheed. And number three, to know His names. Is Allah has got only one, does He has only one name Allah? Or do, are there many other names? These names, what is the relationship between Allah and those other names? Here also, when you come across some people who have the names, for example, Karim, Rahim, these are the names of Allah, Malik. Some people may come and confuse them and say, why, why, why you, your name is Rahim? You have to be known as Abdul Rahim. Karim, Abdul Karim, Jabbar, Abdul Jabbar. What's the issue there? We want to discuss about that. Then to know his attributes. In Arabic, they, they are known as Sifat, Sifat of Allah. What are these Sifats? And these Sifats, do we have some of these Sifats or not? Did he give them to us or not? And to know the benefits of Tawheed, that is the cornerstone of our, of our discussion. Insha'Allah ta'ala. So, Allah, Masha Allah, Allah, for those who know, that they don't know, at least even if we don't know Arabic language, whenever we see the writings like that, then that means something special. I have come across some people, when they enter our houses, they don't see any writings in our houses, they say, is this the house of a Muslim or what? Even there's no picture, frame of Allah. Meaning what? We need to associate ourselves with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it's a good thing. Today we are talking about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in terms of Tawheed. Now, Tawheed or Tawheed, the way we write it, the meanings of this word, number one, when we say Tawheed, we mean the oneness of God. Oneness. Oneness of God. Or sometimes we say unity of God. The idea of oneness mean, meaning he is one and only one. Unity of God meaning everything is from him. And whatever we see as the manifestations of whatever is happening around the world is because of the unity of Allah. Also, when we say Tawheed, we mean the concept of monotheism in Islam. Mono. When we say mono means one. Monotheism. The idea that the wahdaniya is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So here when we use these words, we learn that God or Allah is one. And mono plus theism, we get monotheism. This is the belief in Allah who is one, to believe in one God. And sometimes when we talk to people, they say people who follow monotheism now are the three categories of people who follow Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, who are known as people of Abrahamic faith. Because why? We all acknowledge Prophet Ibrahim, alayhi wa ala nabiyina Muhammad, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi wa Oh. Allah Muhammad wa So we are muwahhidin and that is monotheism. We believe in tawhid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we are we, we, we are known with the idea of tawhid in difference uh, compared to Jewish, Jew, Jew, Jewish and Christians the way we believe in Tawheed, of course, there are differences, especially when it comes to the Sifat uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, those attributes as we are going to see, inshallah. So these are the meanings of Tawheed. Also, when we come to the other meanings, Tawheed is the religion's most fundamental concept and holds 
that Allah or God, literally, God is one. Because of the principle of Tawheed, the Islamic belief in God is considered unitarian, meaning Allah is one, unity, concept of unity of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we say Tawheed, we mean one, one Wahid, Wahid Ahad, Ahad, he is the only one, and that's why we are known as Muwahideen. Tawheed constitutes the foremost article of the Muslim profession of faith. Any person wants to become a Muslim, we say you need to proclaim Shahada Tayyip, or three Shahada. But the first one is Ashhadu An La Ilaha Illallah. That is the article of the Muslim profession of faith. The first part of Shahada. The Islamic declaration of faith is the declaration of belief in the oneness of God. La ilaha illallah. Now you ask yourself a question. When you talk to someone or you are bringing information, you want to give information to someone, you cannot start with negative. You need to start with positive. But why in the declaration of shahada we start with la? And la means no. Why we don't say na'am? Or we use any positive, for example, article or preposition. But here we see la ilaha. There is no God. And then we say illallah, except God. Arabs say when you use this particular kind of expression, it's to, to give emphasis in what you say. There is no anyone except him. So it, it means that you are using more powerful language than a normal one. And that's why you start with negation. And not only that, when you say, La ilaha, there is no God, illallah, except Allah, it means that you want to keep all those false gods aside in order for you to bring Allah, the reality, the truth, the haq closer to you. And that's why you begin with La ilaha illallah. Because if you don't start there, you may bring anyone who seems to be God while they are not gods. And then to remove them from your heart and mind will be difficult. And that's why you start with La ilaha illallah. Quran in Tawheed. The Holy Quran asserts the existence of a single and absolute truth that transcends the world. He is a unique, independent, and indivisible being who is independent of the entire creation. Allah. Allah is unique. Unique means you cannot compare him with anyone else or anything else. Independent. He doesn't need anything. But we need him. And he is indivisible being. We cannot see him. We cannot perceive him with our five senses. We cannot touch him. We cannot smell him. We cannot even feel him that he is like any other being. So we understand him with our hearts and minds. Pure intellect. And Allah is independent of the entire creation. The Holy Prophet understood him very well. And that's why when he taught his companions about the Allah, he taught them very well. And the best of all the students was Imam Amir al muminin Ali bin Abi Talib, salawatullahi wa salam. Allah, 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 Allah. And when it comes to this particular part, you see Imam Amir al muminin especially when he was in Iraq, Every morning he will go to that area of Masjid Kufa, Masjid Kufa, where he attained his Shahada. He would go there before Salatul Fajr each morning and he will do his Munajat. Mawlaya ya Mawlaya, anta al Mawla wa ana al Abd. And then he will continue. This is before Salatul Fajr. Everyone is sleeping. Imam Amirul Mu'minin will 
talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We'll acknowledge his wahdaniya each and every morning. Mawlaya ya mawlaya. Oh my Lord, oh my Lord. Antal mawla. You are the Lord. Wa anal abd. And I am the servant. Wa hal yarhamul abda illa al mawla. In order for me as a servant to receive your mercies, I will not get them from anyone except you as my Lord. And then he will mention many other things as per the munajat of Amirul Mu'mineen. So when we talk about Allah, those are the qualities we need to give it to him because he is independent of the entire creation. He doesn't need us. We need him. In each and everything, we need him. He is al ghani and we are fuqara, plural of fakir. He is independent, self-existing, self-subsisting. He doesn't need us, but we need him. So he is a special being. And when we come to know that, we need to be closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God, according to Islam, is a universal God. This point is very important. Universal. We live in the world we call universe. Allah, God, is a universal God. He is not a local God. Yeah. You say, if I go, for example, to Africa, Allah is there. He's not in Europe. And unfortunately, sometimes our people, when we say we go to live in Europe, they think that there is no God there. Why? Because of the idea that it's easy to get astray here. If you go to Mecca, then you may be closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala than in other places. So even some people may say, I need to move to Mecca. No, God is not a local being. He is a universal. He is not a tribal God. That you can say, for example, because I'm not from this particular tribe, then something will be missing from me because I'm not part and parcel of that. No, 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 Allah is not a tribal. So he favors this tribe and he doesn't favor the others. No. Oh, of one country only. That Allah is be belongs or the country belongs to Allah, other countries are not. God is, is an absolute who integrates all affirmative values. All the sifat, in Arabic they call them sifat, the qualities which you are talking about, the positive qualities, you can find them with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But yes, there are questions which we need to come and talk and we'll discuss about these questions. For example, if God is not a local God, not a tribal, not for one particular country. What happens then sometimes we see the Western world is more developing or developed than the rest of the world. Why some people are more intelligent than others? Why some people are more healthier than others? Why some people are... They have everything and some don't have... They, they have nothing. What's happening there? If God is not the way we have said. So what is happening here? Inshallah, these are issues which we will discuss when we come to talk about the sifat, the qualities of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this point takes us to names of Allah. And I will give this as a, a homework to you, not to do writing in an in in exercise books, no. But whenever you have time, please go back to names of Allah. Especially, I would advise you to recite Surah number 7. Surah Al-A'raf. Ayah 180. Why? Because it talks about other names of Allah, which we call them Asma'ullahil Husna. The beautiful names or excellent names of God. According to the Holy Quran, there are 99 names of God, which are known as Asma'ullahil Husna. وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَدُعُوهُ بِهَا As we are going to see. The divine names project divine attributes, which in turn project all the levels of the creation down to the physical plane. Aside from the supreme name Allah, 
and the Ar-Rahman and few other specific names like Al-Malik or Malik al-Muluk, King of Kings. Other names may be shared by both God and human beings. And that's why I said sometimes when your name is Karim, people, some people with wrong understanding of Tawheed may come to you and say, why are you called, you are, you are called Karim? Karim is only Allah. You should be known as Abdul Karim. However, we say, if you call yourself as Karim or your father, mother call you as Karim, and in their mind, you are Karim like Allah, the Karim, then there is wrong understanding there. But most of the time, the parents don't give the names to mean that. They will call you Rahim. They will call you, for example, Majid. But they don't, they don't mean that you are like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You are one of the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this world. So when we, we have that idea and understanding, then it becomes easy for us to discuss with any, any other person. Isn't it Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he talks about the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam? Once again, salawat. Wama arsalnaka illa Isn't it the eye of the Holy Quran? Wama arsalnaka illa Just take the word rahma. Wama arsalnaka illa rahma, and we have not sent you as except as a rahma. So the holy prophet is rahma, isn't it? When we recite Bismillah, what do we say? Bismillah ar Rahman rahim So Rahman is the one who holds the rahma. Allah is Rahman. From him we get Rahma. Rasulullah, Allah says he's Rahma also. So, Allah Rahma, Rasulullah Rahma, the same name has been used by Allah and Rasulullah. And not Rasulullah called himself, but it was Allah who called Rasulullah as Rahma. So once we understand this, nobody should come and, and confuse you why your name is Rahma, for example. We have some ladies, for example, their names as uh, Rahma. Why are you, are you, are you, why are you known as Rahma? I'm one of the manifestations of understanding Allah's Rahma, and that's why he or she is known by that particular name. Yes, it will be, it will be wrong, and it will be shirk to call someone with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like the ones which we have mentioned, and thinking that he has the power like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Asma'ul Husna, according to Surah Al-A'raf, ayah number 180, the ayah completely says like this, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. وَلِلَّهِ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى فَدُعُوهُ بِهَا وَذَرُوا الَّذِينَ يُلْحِدُونَ فِي أَسْمَائِهِ سَيُجْزَوْنَ مَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ and Allah's are the best names, excellent names, Asma'ullah al-Husna. Therefore, call on him thereby. Use these names to call Allah. Use these names to ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do we do that? Yes, we do. In the holy month of Ramadan, when we sit down to recite Dua Jawshan al-Kabir, we use these names. Inshallah, we'll do this Saturday so you can... MashaAllah. Salve ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. We use this name. And he, Allah says, Fadu'uhu biha. Call on him thereby through these names. Use this name. And leave alone those who violate the sanctity of his names. They shall be recompensed for what they did. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got many names. He wants us to ask him through these names. Why? Because sometimes when you use the name Allah, you may not understand him properly sometimes according to whatever is happening within our lives. Use a Rahman. Use a Rahim. Walillahi al-asma'ul husna fadu'uhu biya. 
Alhamdulillah, our scholars, they made, for example, the students to memorize these names. In that line where it says, Nas'aluka ya man huwallahu alladhi la ilaha illa huwa ar-Rahman, ar-Rahim, al-Malik, al-Quddus, al-Salam, al-Mu'mi, al-Muhaymi, al-Aziz, al-Jabbar, al-Mutakabbir, until the names, all the 99 names. These are the names, if we put them in a beautiful way of making our children to know, and we keep informing them about these names, they will enjoy to be closer to their religion, because why? They are ways of going closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is the ayah. Imam Amirul Mu'minin, Ali bin Abi Talib, Salawatullahi wa In Nahjul Balagha, this is the first quote by Nahjul Balagha. He says, in his quotations contain the first rational proofs among Muslims of the unity of God about Tawheed of Allah, Imam Amirul Mumini says, God is one, means that he is away from likeness and numeration. He is not divisible even in imagination. La tudirikuhul absa. You cannot perceive him with your, your understanding to say God is like this. Number, there is no number with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he's one, he's not only one. Wahid ahad. If there is any other number we can say instead of one, we would use that. Because when you say one, there is two. But in Arabic Allah is ahad, he's not one. The only one is the unique. Imam Amir al says, the first step of religion is to accept, understand, and realize him as the Lord. Allah. That's the Tawheed. The first step, which step can we take? He says, the first one is to accept, understand, and realize him as the Lord. And then he says, the correct form of belief in his unity is to realize that he is so absolutely pure and above nature that nothing can be added to or subtracted from his being. That is one should realize that there is no difference between his person and his attributes. Attributes, yeah? Sifatullah. When we say Allah is Al-Khaliq, Al-Khaliq is Allah. He is Al-Razaq, the one who gives sustenance. Al-Razaq is Allah. Allah and the razaq are the same. That his attributes and his person are the same. And his attributes should not be differentiated or distinguished from his person. So this is Imam Amirul Mumini. He's telling us we need to understand not only name Allah, but also his attributes, which are divided into major two parts. Those which are positive and those which are negative. The positive ones are exactly like him. You cannot separate them. Imam Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu wa sallam hu alayhi sallallahu Muhammad wa Muhammad Allahumma sallallahu wa Muhammad wa Muhammad has mentioned Allah. This, this khutbah in Najul Balab is very long, but we need to refer it again and, and again. We refer to it. When we talk about sifatullah or attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what do we mean by sifat? We mean that adjective which you give it to Allah which fits him properly. <coughs> Here, attribution of divinity to a created entity, shirk is considered a denial of the truth of God, and thus a major sin. Any swifa, any attribute of Allah, you take it and you give it to someone else, you have committed shirk. Allah is al Hay. The one who gives life. Without him, we wouldn't be alive. And you go, you say, there's someone else who can give life. The way Allah gives life, that is shirk. And you have done, you have committed a major sin because this is a dhulm. You are taking attribute of Allah, you're giving it to someone else. 
Allah is the one who provides to you not only your food, your drink, the air you are exhaling, inhaling, exhaling, He's the one who is giving you that. If it were not for Allah, we wouldn't be able to live, to survive. You are taking that con uh, attribute, you are giving it to someone else. Shirk. Allah is everything. You take all those everything, sifats of Allah, you give them to other people. To give a quality of Allah to someone is to someone else is shirk. And that's why Luqman al-Hakim, when he talks to his son, according to Surah Luqman, he says, Inna shirka la dhulmun azweel. Shirk is to, to commit injustice, which is a manifest injustice, clear major injustice. <coughs> Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created you, gave you whatever you have, and you give the, the attributes to other people. And, go back a bit. There is a lot to discuss about shirk in our next coming lecture, inshallah. And we will discuss about this to show the difference between shirk and tawheed. Shia Muslims, followers of Imam Amirul Mu'mineen, they follow Rasulullah. They believe in Allah. They believe that God is alone in being. There is no any other being like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's alone in his being. Alone with his names, his attributes, his actions, his theopanies. Allah is the only one. The totality of being therefore is he. Through him comes from him and returns to him. And that's why when we lose someone who is so dear, what do we say? Inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi raji'un. We are from Allah and to Him we shall return. Because we believe that all the attributes go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. God is not a being next to or above other beings. His creatures, He is, be <coughs> he is being, the absolute act of being. Wujud mutlak in Arabic they call that. Everything which is existing is known as wujud. Anta mawjud, you are existing. Ana mawjud, I am existing. We all exist, but Allah is mawjud. He is existing, but his wujud is mutlaq. Cannot be compared to any other being. Why? Because our existence needs his existence. His existence doesn't need our existence. And that is, he is wujud mutla. For if they were being other than he, i.e. creature of being, God would no longer be the unique. As this divine essence is in infinite, his qualities are the same as his essence. Essentially, there is one reality, which is one and invisible, and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For this, Tawheed and Shirk, there's a border there. This border between theoretical Tawheed and Shirk is to know that every reality and being in its essence, attributes and action are free from him or himness. Then that is Tawheed. Every supernatural action of the prophets is by God's permission. As Quran point, points it, Bi'ithnillah, or Bi'ithnihi. Now the question here is, can some people have the power which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has got that power for them to perform some supernatural things like the way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does? The answer is yes. Nabiullah Isa, alayhi wa ala nabiyyina salam, used to revive the dead people. He used to bring them back to life. Dead people, he revives them to life. Someone is dead, he's bringing him back to life. Someone who is blind cannot see, he makes him to see. Someone who is so ill, he will make him to become healthy again. But whatever he did, he said, I do this be even in love. I do this with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So when we do with permission of Allah, it doesn't become shirk. Because you depend 
on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we believe there is a, someone somewhere there has got the power like the power of Allah, can revive people, can cure the blind people, can cure those who are ill, and we say he is God, that is shirk. But we say maybe he has been given the power by Allah and that's why he is capable of doing whatever he is doing. It is not shirk. It is Tawheed. To border between the Tawheed and Shirk in practice is to assume that something as an end in itself, independent from God, not as a road to God, to Himness. This border needs purification of our intentions. And that's why when we go, for example, to the Dhari, the grave of any Ma'asum, and you see people hugging the grave, they don't want to leave the grave. They want to hang on those windows of the grave of Imam Ma'asum, Imam Amirul Muminin, Imam Abi Abdullah, and all the Aimma. They don't want to go. They say, why don't you hang to Allah? You hang to this Imam. And some other people come and say, these Shias, you know what they like, this hanging on these windows of their Imma. This is shirk. We say, no, no, no. To border between the Tawheed and Shirk in practice is to assume something as an end in itself. That whatever power this being has belongs to him, not to anyone else. That is Shirk. But to say, Imam Amirul Muminin, the knowledge he had, the power, and so on and so forth, he didn't get it from himself. It was where? From Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is Tawheed. And that's the difference between us and other people. We believe that whatever qualities our A'imma alayhi salam were bestowed by Allah, this was from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, not from themselves. So our intentions need to be pure. We come and see you this flag. We kiss it. We rub our faces on it. If we take it as the final end, there is no any connection with, with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it becomes shirk. You see tabut passes and you go, you rub, you hug it. If you think that that tabut is the end result of whatever you do, and that this tabut has the power by itself, it's shirk. But if you say that this is connected to Imam, Imam to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I'm doing tawassul only. It is through this I'm going to Allah, then it's not shirk. So the thin line needs to be informed because some people may not understand that. So our intention should be pure when it comes to this particular point. The summary of our lesson discussion to, tonight, we find it in Surah Al-Ikhlas. Alhamdulillah, we know the Surah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after Bismillahir Rahman Rahim, says, Qul huwa Allahu. What did he say? Ahad. Qul huwa Allahu. Ahad. The wordings which he chose there are very important. If we pray and we see these wordings in our minds, then our salah will be complete salah, inshaAllah. Qul, say, Huwa, he, Allahu, Allah, Ahad is one. I repeat again, the word one is because we don't have any other word to use. Because Allah didn't say, Qul huwa Allahu wahid. Wahid is one. Ahad is not one. But we don't have other words. So we say Allah is one. Allah is Ahad. Ahad, there is no two, no three, no four. When we say one, you can find two, three, and four. And that's why other people say Allah is unique. Qul huwa Allahu Ahad. Allahu Swamad. Allah is He on whom all depend. He is a Swamad. All depend on Allah. I go to work. I wait until the end of month for me to get my salary. So I depend on my boss. He also depends on something else. 
The consumer depends on the provider, the provider depends on someone. We all depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is a samad. The doctor, we depend on him for him to cure us. The doctor depends on the books he reads. He depends on, no, on knowledge for him to be able to understand our bodies. He depends on something. Eventually, we depend on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that's why we say this lesson is very important because if we understand Tawheed properly, there will be no any fear. La khawf wa la huzn. Why? Because we would understand Allah properly. Lam yalid wa lam yula. He says this. He begets not. No is he begotten. He doesn't have children. No does he have a father. Doesn't have children for him to be inherited. Doesn't have a father for him to say, I depend on him and my being started through him. Lam yalid wa lam yula. Wa lam yakul lahu kufuan ahad. And no one is like him. End of the story. Lam yakul lahu kufuan ahad. No one is like him. So we continue. We go to the next uh, slide, the benefits of Tawheed. Number one, the Holy Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam has said, Say, La ilaha illallah and you will achieve success. Rasulullah, Qulu la ilaha illallah tuflihu. Kulu, say, La ilaha illallah, tuflihu, you will achieve success. What success are you talking about, Ya Rasulullah? Look at these points. The belief in, in Tawheed will set us free from shirk. If I have two bosses, I'm working for them. One calls me at night, come to work. Another one says, come to, to work during the morning. I'll be confused. It will not be easy for me to serve both of them. What if there are three? What if there are four? What if there are five and six and ten and I want to serve all of them? I'll be mad. But if I have one, it's easy, I can listen. Allah is one. When we believe in Tawheed, this keeps us away from shirk. Number two. It will bring us peace of mind, especially in the time of difficulties. Tawheed will bring peace of mind. Brothers and sisters, these days many people kill themselves. They kill themselves. They jump in front of a train. They throw the, themselves in, in a river or sea. Why? Because life doesn't have any meaning. I'm fed up. Let me finish myself. When you look at their histories, if they are not sick, then they do not understand Tawheed. Because if you understand Tawheed, Tawheed will bring peace of mind in the times of difficulties. Then you will understand that this is a tribulation. This is just a trial from Allah. And I will overcome this. And not only that, the, fo the following point, Tawheed will make us prepare for the life after death. Were we created to live in this world for 1,000 years, 200 years, 300 years? No. We will die. A day will come, we will, will be known as Mayit. Then what will come after that? Life after death. Life begins after death. Tawheed will make us prepare ourselves for that. So our life will have a meaningful, we will be a meaningful life. Why? Because we prepare. Not only that, it will make us be able to distinguish between truth and falsehood. Truth, today, people search for it. Sometimes it's difficult to find. Look at the problems which are happening in this world. What, where is the truth? It's not easy. But through Allah, we can understand what is the truth. وَقُلْ جَاءَ الْحَقُّ وَزَحَقَ الْبَاطِلِ Haq has come, the truth. Batil has vanished. And always, battle will vanish. Here, when we have Tawheed, it will make us to understand where is the truth and where is the falsehood. Not only that, it will give us correct directions in this world how to go about. And that's why Imam Amirul Muminin in that lecture says the first thing to understand 
is Tawheed. No Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The rest will come. But if our Tawheed is shaky, we don't understand Allah properly, then we will be in difficulties. These are the points uh, which we have been able to discuss. There is this particular book, if uh, those people who like to read, go to this particular book, The Essential World Wisdom. Uh, the book is written by Sayyid Hussein Nasr. This Sayyid Hussein Nasr is an Iranian scholar who lives in America. Mashallah, he has written a lot extensively in terms of Tawheed and all the issues which are related to Mother of Ahlul Bayt. And another scholar who is a William Chittick. William Chittick is an American white uh, guy. He has done a lot uh, of research in terms of Islamic uh, history and Islamic issues, Islamic philosophy, Islamic uh, aqaid, and, and so on and so forth. He has done a lot, him and Hussein Nasser, Said Hussein Nasser. If you read their books, they will help you. There were a few conferences, they came back here to London to give the lectures, and you could see the caliber of people who attend their lectures. Why? Because they work alone. And also, Shahid Murtaza Mutahari. Murtaza Mutahari has written a lot in, in, on this particular field. If you Google his books, you can see, but if you want to find all the articles, including what I have depended, you go to the website alislam.org, you click Tawheed, you will see a lot of material there, and you can be able to read. So inshallah, we'll continue next week with the se second part of this discussion. But if there's any contribution, any question, please feel free to say. Yes. Uh, I would like to know if uh, there is a hadith that says, if you know the light names of Allah, of by heart to go to paradise. I haven't come the, uh, across the hadith. But it could be the truth. In Sunni, uh, they say it. However, what is the context there? This is what we need to understand. The way we have said there, if you, you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his names and his attributes, and you do du'a, and you believe in those names, and you act according to the names, definitely you will go to paradise. Why? Because you always want to know what does Allah wants me to do. <coughs> when it comes to rahma, karam, and so on and so forth. So there is a reality in, in that particular hadith. And, and I, I, I encourage each and everyone to know this particular names in order for us, inshallah, when we discuss about this particular subject uh, in our uh, next week lesson or the week after, inshallah, we'll see the benefit of them, inshallah. Asante. Any other contribution? Yes, Brother Kusama. Uh, the concept of one, mm. uh, as, as opposed to Ahad, I mean, one normally would be something that has a boundary you can say this is one orange or one mm. yeah. so and, and it can be divided into two or you could have but ahad is something that is without boundaries it's, 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 it unifies everything it's ah, sant. yeah it's true and that's why i said our language is so limited and that's why we use words thinking that we have covered each and everything but in reality it's not so it's, it's nice to have this kind of uh, elaboration in order for us. Whenever we use the word, we know ah, there is deficiency here. It's because we don't have any word, so we use this. And that's why there are many other scholars who are saying that our, our lisan, our tongue, our language is mahdud. So it's difficult even to understand Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we need to understand him through his wordings in order for us to understand who Allah is now. Another point about naming, using names of Allah, uh, I think it, it's, it's good to see that there's a distinction between, say, Karim and Al Karim. Mm. Where Karim, anybody can be Karim, anybody can be generous. But Al Karim, the generous, which means there's nothing better than you know, the. It's only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ahsan. This point is very important. In Arabic language, when you say al, alif and lam, it means 
this is something specific. So it's a proper. When you don't use al in some names, or most of the names, then it becomes something common. Anyone can have that. So when you say kitabun and al-kitab, you look at the Holy Quran, for example, uh, Surah um, uh, Al-Baqarah uh, in the beginning, Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alif La Mim Dalika, Dalika Al Kitab. He didn't say Dalika Kitabun. Why? Because this is a specific book he's talking about. So it's true. In terms of attributes, when we use Al, then it becomes specific for Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, regardless of. Uh, our understanding of the language or not. But when we don't use all definite article, then it becomes any. And nice point. The only thing I don't know whether this also applies to Rahman. Ar-Rahman, yes. I mean, when you say Rahman and Ar-Rahman. Yeah, Ar-Rahman in the 99 names of Allah, Ar-Rahman, you see with Alif and Lam. Yeah. And that shows something. But when you say Rahman, does it... Rahmanun, uh, it depends also with what are you intending to. Yeah? But most of the time, Allah is Ar Rahman. Quli du'u Allaha awi du'u Rahman. Ayyamma tadu'u falahul asma'ul husna. Call him Rahman or call him, Quli du'u Allah, call him as Allah or Ar Rahman. He has the excellent names. Use these names. Now, Hajj. Yes, please. Question about theophanies. I notice that it's in plural. Mm -hmm. So, what do we mean by theophany? First of all, in, in Shia Islam, I would say it's like in English a theophany. But why is it in plural here? Uh, what's the, the, the my question is why when when we go through the slides mm. and we believe in theophanies mm -hmm. and not theophany, not one, but theophanies plural. So. What are the theophanies that we could notice in Shia Islam, for example? Okay, keep the question till next week, inshallah, we'll come back to it. Okay. And it's a question, proper question, at its place. Thank you. Ahsan tu. Khair, inshallah. Any other contribution? Ahsan tu. Sisters, if you have questions and uh, you want to ask, mm -hmm. inshallah, maybe next week you can write the questions or the microphone yeah. will be given to you, inshallah. At the end, Surah Al Fatiha is requested. For Sayyid Ghazi Shah, Bibi Ghulam Fatima, Sayyid Amjad Hussein Shah.